Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today we have two very special guests. Brian H. Schertz is a molecular pathologist at the University of Washington. His current research explores using genealogy connections as a way to help families prevent hereditary cancer. Thank you. Welcome, Brian. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, another guest is Justin Goodson. He is a professor at St. Louis University. His research and teaching focus on supply chain management, business, and now, and now start again. Sorry. Analytics. Excuse me. His research and teaching focus on supply chain management, business analytics, and applied mathematics. He holds a doctoral degree from the University of Iowa and master's and bachelor's degrees from the University of Missouri. He enjoys photography and musical composition. Welcome, Justin. Thanks, Allison. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you so much to both of you for submitting your essays to Dialogue. I thoroughly enjoy both of your essays. And um, let's start with Brian. So Brian, you submitted this really fascinating piece and it's titled Genetics and Gathering the House of Israel. And just your title alone, it's really captivating because, you know, this is a field that I feel, yes, I've heard of gathering Israel in a church quite frequently, but I haven't really heard or read anything deeper than, you know, missionaries uh, go out to uh, many different parts of the world to do missionary work. And that's my understanding of gathering Israel, other than, you know, us who are not uh, full-time missionaries, we go to the temple or we do family research and, you know, take names to the temple to do temple work. That's all I know about uh, gathering Israel. So do you mind telling us a little bit about your work, your essay, uh, what you write about? Oh, it's just all the fascinating yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about your, your essay. I'd be happy to. So, so this really was focusing on... Um, you know, the, the, the a more specific uh, th thought of, of gatherings. We think of this, you can think of like what you described as a very broad concept of g gathering people. Um, and it seems like th there there has been historically a view of gathering you know, from the articles of faith. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and the restoration of the 10 tribes. And you know, the, the, the questions I had were really, what does that mean, this literal gathering of Israel? And what's this restoration of the ten tribes? You know, we talk about the the ten tribes, the, the northern ten tribes being lost um, into the land of the north is is, is the the way you hear it. Um, sometime around two thousand six hundred uh, uh, years ago, and um, and the question was, what does it mean this restoration of these ten tribes? Where are these ten tribes? You know, how come we ha haven't found them? Have we found them yet? And if, if so, how, how come um, we don't know more about it? And when I was uh, young, then, you know, my, my Sunday school teachers and my seminary teachers seemed to um, imply that someday the missionaries would find some tribe and say, aha, we found it. You know, th th this is the group that, that's this lost tribe. And, you know, a a as I grew older, then I came to realize that, that, First of all, that that's not going to happen. You know, we we've had, um, we we know enough about the world, and we know enough places in the world, and um, and then also that that um, sh should we even expect that that to happen? And you know, we use a lot of genetics right now to be able to explore mi migratory patterns of different peoples across the the, the world, and um, I go to genetics conferences where, where I get to listen to lectures about people describing. Um, how they use genetics to map all of those, and and so so this comes for me, uh, really asking, you know, could that potentially be used to 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 figure out kind of is there any connection with with this and you know, these lost tribes of Israel? And very quickly coming to the conclusion that no, 
<laughs> there's no way that could happen. You know, there there is no possible way to find a genetic connection to um, these ten tribes of Israel. And, and the reason why is because in order to find a genetic connection with something, you have to have a uh, a, a current a pool that you can say that this is the this is the genetic signal we're looking for, and the genetic signal. Um, and, and so, so without any current reference to be able to find the genetic signal, then it would be impossible. Um, but as I dug further, then I found that um, it, it really, using uh, other genetics principles, it really isn't surprising for everyone in the world, probably, um, to be able to say they're very likely a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's just a, a factor of them being alive that long ago. And the most recent common ancestors of the whole human race are probably, um, we're probably somewhere in that, close to that area and somewhere close to that time. It wouldn't be a stretch at all to say that. And almost certainly um, it, it, an Abraham that existed in that time would be a, a parent and a, a Sarah that existed at that time it would certainly be parents of you know, billions and billions of people today, if not everyone alive today. And um, and that so that was that was a, a, a interesting thought. But then the thing that, that the article really talks about is um, uh, uh, me discovering Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones um, again, and um, kind of really having a revelatory experience for myself to see how Ezekiel was seeing the same types of things that I was seeing, and that um, in order to to and connect people with those that that lost connection with Israel. It really required revelation, um, revelation on a personal level, revelation from patriarchs given patriarchal blessings, and um, revelation on an institutional level. So, so multiple levels of revelation. And the language that Ezekiel uses is language of the Lord commanding Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones that they would live, and then saying these bones are the whole house of Israel. And I, I felt like that as I was looking at the genetics of gathering and seeing that there's there's really nothing there. Um, seeing my in my through my own eyes this, the same thing that Ezekiel was saying when he was you know very proximal to this dispersion of, of these tribes of Israel of of the Lord telling him that there's there's no um, that, 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 that this Israel is lost like like dry bones that couldn't couldn't possibly live and it would really take the revelatory power of God to be able to, to, to bring those back together. That is just so fascinating. And I especially love the part where you write about how the lost tribes, they're lost, uh, they're lost in the sense that they have forgotten who they are and the physical evidence of their birthright is gone. That part really, I thought, oh, that is so powerful. And even though I had no training, no um, education in this specific uh, genetic field, but I understand this line. And I just thought it's so powerful. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that could, yeah, could have an impact on you. Thank you. Thank you. And so now let's ask um, Justin about his essay, so Justin's essay is titled Judging Israel. So this title I think is also very fascinating. So Justin, do you mind telling us, is there any uh, specific meaning behind this title or what does the title mean to you? Yeah, the title's meant to be a, a, a bit of a double meaning. So the the context for the essay is a membership council, which in our in our faith is when, when someone may be uh, uh, judged, so to speak, for for their their sins and potentially excommunicated or or some other action taken against their membership. Um, but the the other meaning of this is uh, what what does it mean to judge a person? Yes, we're formally judging someone on a membership council, but how do we how do we approach the concept of judgment? How do we dis disentangle choice from circumstance, and how how do we deal with that? that mess of things that is our lives. Wow, that's wonderful. And I I totally, through um, reading your essay, I can feel that conflict that, you know, th what you were just describing, 
in your words that is so powerful. And this is the thing, like I have heard of the disciplinary council in a church, but I obviously I never participated in one and I did not know how how to function, how to work. But your piece is so clear and you seriously you take the the reader into the process and you showed us how it's done, or at least in this case, your personal experience, you know, and, and I don't know if all the disciplinary council in the church uh, work exactly like like this one, um, but I can feel the narrator, which is you, the narrator's um, internal conflict that we, um, when I say he, it's the narrator, right? So Justin in the story, he feels one way and how he feels is not really um, the other council members feel. And so the result, obviously, it's a, it's a very difficult situation for the narrator to experience. So Justin, tell us a little bit about this story. How, how did it impact you today? Is it still, um, does it still affect you? Well, Allison, this is, this is a story of conflict or tension between, uh, say religious belief and, and personal conviction. I mean, how, how do you sort these things out? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's about an actual event that took place in my life, but it's also about uh, bigger picture personal struggles and issues, and all of these things kind of coming together in in some sort of uh, traffic jam in my mind in the matter of a few minutes, and then uh, later trying to sort them out and, and make some sense of them. Um, I'm, I'm glad you feel the the tension and the struggle in in the writing. It definitely uh, that's what I wanted to communicate. Um, I, I don't intend really to lead the reader to any particular conclusion, and in fact, I think most readers or most people I know would probably feel differently than I did. Uh, mm-hmm. The intent instead is to help us think about how how do we, how should we, how can we participate in judgment? I mean, we, we judge things all the time from the small to the large in our lives, and I, I really don't, I don't know how judgment might take place after after this life how how does jesus really judge a person is it based on our performance is it something to do with our relationships um how do we disentangle circumstance from um you know our personality etc yeah these are all really great questions and i really feel that impact in your essay in this line where you write to object was to formally withdraw support for my local church leaders, an action that would be frowned upon. So I balk. And that that line, those three words, so I balked. Those three words are really uh it just hits me in the gut. Right. And so could you please tell us a little bit about this? So if you had a chance to go back, and obviously this is, um, you know, uh, we're just imagining if you had a chance to go back to that time, to that situation, to sit in that council again, would you have done anything differently because you, you feel so strongly, um, so differently? Hmm. The rest of yeah, the- that, that that's an interesting question to ask ourselves, right? I mean, what what would we do different in hindsight? Not just in this case, but in in any case in our lives. And the the I think the the caveat with that question is we we have the benefit of hindsight when we have that discussion, and we're making choices in hindsight with information we didn't know at the time or didn't understand. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so you might choose something differently. In this case, however. The only thing I would do different is skip the entire experience because I would rather not have had it. Um, I'm not disappointed in, in the choices I made. I, I haven't really advanced my thinking to, to have come to a particular conclusion. Maybe that, that will be different than what I did. Mm-hmm. And so, so just to give the listeners some context, um, 
the the choice in a disciplinary council is either to vote in favor of the recommendation or opposed to it. And I did neither. I said, I abstain from voting. I'm just not comfortable. Uh, I didn't say it outright, but I, I didn't want to oppose the leadership. Uh, but I also, I, I didn't want to throw my hat into the ring with, with everything that I, that I saw in front of me. So I said, I abstain. Uh, the response was, no, you have to choose. And I said, well, okay, you, you write it down how you, how you please, but my, my choice is to, to stay here in this, this gray zone of ambiguity and just let me stew for a while. Exactly. And I imagine it requires so much courage and just integrity to be able to say that. And I feel like the the narrator, Justin, in this story was a very courageous person and he really tried to do the right thing. And so even though the, I think the decision was uh, to excommunicate that, that person, um, and I'm sure the narrator, Justin, was maybe heartbroken by that, you know, by that decision, but he did the right thing. He did what he thought was right. And I think he should be very proud. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. There's, there's what we think is right for ourselves. And then Mm -hmm. maybe we can try to identify some grand morality we should all aspire to. And uh, I I don't know Mm -hmm. if my personal morals always match up with, with what, uh, you know, divinity might might accept as as good or bad, but uh, I I want to aim for that. And in this in this particular case, I just wasn't sure mm. what was right, and so my choice was to just step back. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes that's what we need to do. I feel right. So that is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. And so I wonder if both of you could please. Tell us a little bit about what you're currently working on. What project, what work are you working on, if you don't mind sharing with our audience? So we'll start from, um, start with Brian, please. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, so related to this, uh, so somewhat related to this, I, I think that's the, 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 uh, the, the bottom line of the, of the essay, I think, is that you know so, sometimes when people go out to, to missionaries, uh, sometimes when people think about the missionaries going out, then they think they're looking for you know the, the specific chosen ones, specific ones who are, who are um, descendants of Abraham, let's say, or who are house of Israel. And you know, my um, experience and my belief is that. We, we should be looking at everyone. We should be looking at every neighbor on the street and say, you know, this is a child of God. This is a descendant of Abraham. This is someone who's the house of Israel. And they might not know it yet. Um, and, and, but, but we shouldn't be looking at some people differently than other people. Um, but we should be thinking that all, every single one is, is uh, every single person um, is someone who has inherited this you know, grand lineage. And we're all related to each other. And so professionally, what I'm doing is actually working on similar projects. So when we find out, we find two people who have hereditary cancer, if they both have the same pathogenic variant, then we can trace them back to a common ancestor. And we can use some of the family history tools that the church um, promotes um, to to be able to uh, find out who else might have that pathogenic variant and help them to be able to... um, to be able to prevent cancer. Um, so it's really kind of fun to be able to apply some of the same principles of family history and genetics to cancer prevention. That That's the, the research that I'm doing now uh, in my professional work. Um, and it's kind of fun to see some of the same things that I learned in my Sunday school family history class, you know, being applied to, to when I was 16 years old, you know, be, be, being, being applied to, to, to the same things I'm doing professionally. Wow, that's amazing. Brian, I really admire you for your service, for sharing your experience, for sharing your training, sharing your expertise to serve your community and to serve your brothers and sisters all around you. Such a role model you are. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Yeah. So now that yeah, so now that's um go to Justin. Justin, do you mind telling us a little bit about what you are working on currently? Sure. Uh, Brian, I appreciate the the rigor in your piece combined with uh, an aspect of spirituality, and I thought it was a beautiful marriage of science and faith. I wish I wish there would be such a strong connection between my own personal research and, and what I have written about personally, but there's not. So I, I work. Let, let me just touch on both of those, Ellis and I. I work in my professional life in in the world of operations research, and in particular, uh, dynamic and stochastic optimization, which is to say, how does somebody make choices across time into the face of uncertainty? And I typically apply this to operational settings, uh, say transportation, uh, logistical issues. Um, I, I'm very interested in, in trying to write memoir, personal narrative style uh, essays, pieces, and I've, I've written quite a bit. And uh, this was my first attempt to try to share that more broadly than just with my, my personal journal. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of Dialogue for publishing the piece, and I hope that I can share uh, similar style articles in the future. Oh, wow. Just the... Oh, I was gonna, sorry. I was going to say that I, I think that you know your um, deep thinking about decision making really comes through in your essay, even though it might not be as as linked to your professional work as it is. And you can you can tell that it's written by someone who has deep thinking about deep deep, think, deep thinking about decision making and how one makes decisions. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciated your essay, and I also I, I just wanted to say that this is my first time you know, publishing a dialogue, and I really 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 appreciate. The, the the venue that it is to to share this type of experience and this type of thinking, and I, I have to say that I, I I had been looking for a place to share this for years um, before someone suggested that I submit it to dialogue, and it really was a really good fit, and and it's been just wonderful reading all the other uh, content that's in dialogue um, as well. Yeah, I feel similarly. Uh I don't, don't know about you, Brian, but I received a, a paper copy in the mail of the journal, and uh, I really have enjoyed going through it. I've read almost the entire thing, and well, what a fantastic publication. So, so what is Israel? I would say this this is uh, you know a, a connection to a shared past and a shared um, covenant. Really, we talk about covenant Israel, and you know the the. Um, covenant with Abraham was to at least the most important parts that I think that's reiterated by Nephi and by uh, Jesus and in, in when he comes to visit the, the Americas is a, a commitment to make the world a better place to bless all the families of the earth that that's what a Abraham was was covenanting to think to to bless all the families of the earth and I think that if it's as everyone finds that connection with other people in the past and with other people in the future that are trying to bless all the families of the earth, I think that's what Israel is. Brian, I share your sentiments. Uh, Israel is, it is the body of Christ. It is the collective us. It is also the, the one. And in, in my piece, uh, Judging Israel is, it's about both of those. Um, there, there's one person in trial. There's, there's also the one person who is myself, and how, how do I uh, parse through my, my decisions and circumstances? And then there is the, the collective body of Christ. How, how do we how do we treat each other, judge each other, live with e with each other, and, and manage those relationships? Wow! Wow, you guys, <laughs> this is amazing. Why are you so amazing? This is great. You're too kind, Allison. Thank you. You are. <laughs> You're too kind first. But I really do appreciate you sharing. You guys are like super intelligent and then also spiritual. I mean, it's hot and, and humble too. I mean, these are three different virtues and you have all three of them. I just feel very privileged to be here with you tonight and to learn from you. So thank you so much. I really, really hope that you will continue to submit your work to Dialogue so that our readers will have the chance to read more, you know, to learn from you because you two are natural teachers. Thank you. We have so much to offer. Thanks, Alice. 
Thank you. It's like it's, it's been really uh, f- fun to talk with you for a few minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Mm-hmm.